I think there's a lot of people that are really looking forward to this. So great, terrific. But but we are live now. So a few people hopefully coming in very shortly. But for everyone that's in here right now, this I you know who he is, Ross Ritchie from Boom Studio, CEO, founder, puts out all those great books and I can't imagine how much work goes into that, but seriously, I appreciate you being on this show today. It means a lot to me, and I know a lot of people were looking forward to it, and we can get started whenever. Well, thanks for having me. Absolutely. So obviously, you know, Boom Studios puts out great books. What's Thank you. What made, what made you, like, Boom Studios? Were you part of anything else to begin with? Or, like, why Boom? You know, there's Image, Marvel. You could have worked for anybody, but you went off, you did your own thing, and you created such a great company now it's try it's killing it you know thank you well i think the reason that people start their own companies is that they don't want to go work for other people and so you know there's there's i've certainly been friends with uh, a lot of folks at marvel and dc uh, for decades and i think those are great companies uh and image uh dark horse pretty much everybody um for a long time, but uh, you know, I'm I'm sort of I have an opinion about how things I'd like to do things, and uh, when you start your own company, you get to you know make that call, and if you're wrong, you get to wear it, and if you're right, you get to proceed forward. So for me, it was um, more about doing my own thing. I started in the business at Malibu Comics uh, 25 years ago, and Malibu was a really large independent. And uh, certainly in the top five publishers next to Marvel and DC. And mm -hmm. uh, I learned a lot working in the marketing department there. And then Marvel bought the company. And when Marvel bought the company, I was able to, for a very short amount of time, I can't remember if it was two months or six months at this point, but I was able to see some of the inner mechanism of how Marvel uh, published. And I was always interested in independent comic book publishing. And the way that I felt uh, was that, you know, I grew up reading Marvel in DC and I have a garage full of those comics, much to my wife's uh, chagrin. And, uh, and I love them. I'm still, you know, I'm friends with Dan Buckley, who uh, is one of the big muckety mucks at Marvel that runs the company and um, friends with most everybody over at DC. And um, I just feel like independent publishing, what's exciting about it is our job as independent publishers is to make the next Marvel in DC. Our job is to build the future. Our job is to do the next exciting thing. And, you know, the background that we have for this is something is killing the children. And, you know, you look at Erica Slaughter and she's a franchisable, iconic character. And I don't Absolutely. think anybody conceptualized her as a superhero, but you could make an argument that she is. You know, you could put her in a crossover with Wolverine and I would buy that. That would make sense to me. Uh, and so I think building tomorrow's franchises is what the independent comic book publishing business is about. Now I'm friends with Mike Mignola. Um, he's a dear friend. I adore him. And he did that with Hellboy. He created uh, movie franchises and tremendous amount of merchandising and, you know, a generation's superhero. It's nearly 30 years old. And um, I think I'm always interested in the frontier of what's coming next and what's the next big project. You know, we just published Berserker. Uh, it's the best-selling uh, first issue uh, that was sold in comic book shops in nearly 30 years. And, you know, it's like Keanu Reeves wants to do something cool. Let's go build that into the next franchise. So um, for me, the story of how I started Boom is once I worked at Malibu, I got to know these incredible Hall of Fame level creators. And one of them was Keith Giffen. Now, if you don't know, Keith's been working in comics since 1975. Thank you so much, Better A Jim. Really appreciate that. Um, Keith's been a writer and an artist. He co created Lobo, he did the Funny Justice League, he worked on 52. The guy's a legend. And he became a friend and he recruited me to help him out on a book he did for Image called Dominion. And through that process, he really encouraged me to start my own publishing company. And I told Keith, the only way that I'm gonna do this is if you make the slate of books that I'm gonna start with, because I knew retailers would order Keith books and they would have no idea who Ross Ritchie is. 
And so if you go back and you look at like the first six months and probably the first like half dozen things that Boom publishes, they're all created by Keith Giffen, created by Keith Giffen, created by Keith Giffen. And uh, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for Keith's interest, his encouragement. And you know, the truth is we found a little dive bar in LA because Keith will not drink at any place that's nice. And I'm being dead serious. And I would say that right in front of him and he would agree. Okay. A little dive bar where beer is $3 and wild away the evening. And he sat there and was like, you need to be a publisher. You need to start publishing. You need to do this. And I told Keith, he was wrong. I said, you know, nobody knows what boom is. Why would anybody care? And when I woke up the next day, I thought a hall of fame talent like Keith Giffen is telling me that I need to do this. Who am I to tell him? No. So he was right. And I'm very lucky that I have people like that in my life. That's awesome. encourage me and support me. I mean, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him. So always great. That's what it is. Sometimes you just really need someone that's going to push you that extra step. I mean, even with AR comics, I had, this was something that I started. I think I talked about this in my last video, but I talked to, I started this because um, obviously I was in the air force. My dad is a huge Marvel comic book reader. That's what he loves. Mm. And me being out here, I'm obviously not home. I can't talk to him every single day. Like, you know, like some people do. But for comic books, this was a way for me to be able to casually talk with my dad. Like, hey, I picked up this book. Did you read this? Yeah. And then we talk about superheroes. And then I just, it grew and it grew. I decided to make an Instagram, do some reviews. I told my dad about that too. And from there, it turned into, well, why don't you make videos? Why don't you do this? And why, I, I had no reason not to. Wow. And it's just such an awesome passion, and especially for something that I can share with him. And, you know, we bounce ideas off each other and... I mean, I'm going to be honest, his taste in books, it's not all there. I'm still trying to get him on the indie train. He's hes obsessed with Marvel. He knows that Marvel's not really doing so hot right now. He's getting only a few books here and there, but his older collection is insane. He's got stuff that would blow my mind. I, I know what he has, and I still don't even know what he has. So, so when does he go on vacation, and where does he live? Uh, so that's funny, too. He doesn't go on vacation. <laughs> oh, I no! Think I'm, how am I, I think supposed I've to gone sneak on... into his house and take all of his cool keys if he's... Do you remember when you invited Ross Ritchie on your show and he threatened to steal your dad's comics? Oh, my dad would love to sit down with you and talk about it, though. I, I'll tell but you, it... I love old books, man. I, know, oh, I, I love is. the history. <laughs> there he is, Keith. I love it. I love so, it. So it... Keith is actually the owner or manager at the encounter. It's the comic book shop that I go to when I'm back home in Bethlehem. And you know, my dad, he's not up to date with computers and uh, electronics. So they always watch it together, but it's good to know that they're laughing at that one. I love it. I love it. Well, I love comic <laughs> book history. And you know, I, 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 especially, I was actually getting into a really big debate because you know, the Stan Lee book just came out uh, and uh, yep. was was talking. Paul Levitz, who ran DC Comics for thirty years, was the publisher. Uh, excuse me, president of DC, is my mentor. And um, let's just say that I have access to amazing uh, facts about comic book history that most people never get a chance to hear those kind of stories. So, oh, anyway. what are some cool ones? <laughs> what are some of the cool ones? <laughs> hey, oh, now if I for everyone that's in here right now, you obviously missed the early conversation that we had before I went live. This man knows the history of Texas. And <laughs> he, he laid so much info on me that I was like, oh my God, I'm sitting here right now. Just, wow. <laughs> oh, I had no idea. Well, so, I, I think that's what Texans know too much about Texas history. And one of the reasons they do is that they teach it in public school every year, all the way through elementary school. And so- that's cool. um, yeah, so they just drill it into your head. And uh, I think it's one of the reasons why Texans are so obnoxious is they just learn all this Texas history and they, they, they just teach you that you're, you're different. Um, uh, but I'm trying to think of a Levitt story about, um, well, you know, I, I mean, I'm gonna, this is going to be cheating, okay? But, you know, the original name of the company is All American. And they changed their name to Detective Comics. So DC Comics is actually Detective Comics Comics. Cool. So there I'm gonna I'm gonna tangle up the etymology of it, but basically there were two companies, which is one is what you would know as DC, which had Superman and Batman, and the other one was All American, which had Flash, Green Lantern, and Wonder Woman. 
and those two companies actually merged together. Uh, and that really makes that the resultant company, I believe, was referred to as National. And um, the old timers called DC National. When I say old timers, I mean the professionals that worked in the business, the writers and the artists and the editors, called it National all the way up through the late 70s. So if you walked up to them and tried to talk to them about DC Comics, it would take them a minute to realize what you were referring to. But um, there's a lot of there's a lot of great uh, writers and artists. One of the stories I would tell you from my own personal experience is the guy that co-created um, Hal Jordan, who is the, the Silver Age Green Lantern. Uh, the guy that wrote those stories, his name was John Broom. In the late 60s, he tried to organize a union to get paid better as a comic book writer. And what they did was they fired John Broom as well as Gardner Fox. And they hired a bunch of kids. And those kids were uh, people of the generation of Marv Wolfman and Lynn Wein and Mike Friedrich. And they hired these younger comic book enthusiasts to write the comics. And uh, John Broom left the United States, went to Asia and became a uh, English teacher in Japan. And then he, the only comic book convention he had ever went to, he went to San Diego Comic Con, I wanna say in like 2003. And mm -hmm. can you imagine showing up at San Diego Comic Con if you've never been to a convention? I tried going to it a couple of years back. The only one I've been to was one of the smaller ones. I don't even know if it was a comic con, but it, it, they had some books. It was more like gaming in Philly. And it was a little bit on the smaller side, despite it being at like a big convention center. But mm -hmm. I've been looking at those tickets every year for San Diego, but I just was never able to pull the trigger. And then COVID happened. It was like, oh, here we go. Yeah. Well, Broom, Broom went to one comic book convention. It was San Diego Comic Con. And then the next year he passed away. Mm. So hey, at least amazing. he got to go though. Yeah. And see the you know all the empire that had been built out of some of the creative contributions that he had made. So anyway, it's uh, there, there's a there's a lot of fun history to talk about. We your your dad and I someday will talk about Stanley. I bet you he would love that conversation. <laughs> he was a great guy. He was, it, I, I, it was an honor for me to work with him. I published three Stanley series. That's and awesome. He was he was a joy. He was the. He, the, one of the nicest moments of my life was standing at security at Seattle Tacoma airport and going home from Emerald city comic con. And there was like 500 people trying to get through TSA. And I hear Ross Ritchie. And I turn around and I look <laughs> and it's Stan Lee and he's picked me out of the, picked me out of the pack. And he says, great to see you. And he moves, you know, he gets to go to the front of the line. Right. So they put him through first. That's um, so cool. I was just, I'll never forget it. I was like, I was like, okay, that's a bucket <laughs> list right there. Yep. Stan Lee recognized me. Ah, it's amazing. I would be on my phone immediately, immediately and be like, yo, you will never guess what just happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, is it probably took me 10 minutes to realize it happened. My brain was smoking, you know, my, my head exploded. You know, Five-year-old Ross just pooped his pants. <laughs> So with Boom, we just got done talking about DC, a little bit of Marvel. You guys are obviously doing something that's so different. Uh, you Image, like you said, Dark Horse, all the independent publishers are doing something completely different than Marvel and DC right now. And in my opinion, and a lot of people I've been talking with is DC, they're obviously trying a lot of new things. They're doing Infinite Frontier right now. They just had the future state. And, you know, they keep putting all these short stories in there. Marvel is just pumping out a lot of smaller miniseries and just kind of regurgitating the same stuff. But what what are you finding that's been successful with you? Like for Boom Studios, you obviously are putting out great stuff. The background, something's killing the children. It's, in my opinion, probably one of the top selling, if not the top series for Boom Studios right now. Everyone I talk to has either read it or they're doing whatever they can to get a hold of those trade paperbacks. To well, read the, it. the sales on the book is completely insane. You know, the, the first issue, that first print, it's, pro, it's a little over 30,000 copies on the first print. And I think we've done nine printings and we're over 80 on that first issue. So you can do the math. Uh, you know, I've been doing this for 15 years and you don't go through that many printings. It's completely no. insane. Um, have, but, have you been on, have you been on eBay to even see what it's going for lately? I, you know, I kind of rely upon folks on Instagram to point it out to me because I get a little overwhelmed. 
and I just can't track it all. And it it's it's utterly incredible. But one of the other thing, and and the trade has gone through the first trade has gone through three printings. And the really? numbers, even the trade, the numbers on the first trade are crazy. That's it's incredible. Like, I mean, it is giant. It is gigantic. Like I can't, I don't think people understand how massive these numbers are. And the thing is, is the uh, one, you know, like once in future is gigantic and something is killing the children is so big that people end up talking about something is killing the children. But if something is killing the children wasn't around, all you'd be doing is talking about how gigantic uh, Once in Future is. Once in Future is a complete monster. And the, really? Oh, it's it's huge. It's a total phenomenon. We're going through, I think we're in our second print on the first trade, and it sold like two-thirds somewhere around, I'm going to get the numbers wrong, but somewhere around two-thirds of what something is killing the children is selling, which is a mo wow. monster hit. And... You know, yeah. like Seven Secrets is has been huge for us. We only find that them when they're dead one. has been huge. I love Seven Secrets so much. It's just, you know, I love all these projects. It's hard for me to single one out, but I have a real uh, affection for Seven Secrets. And We Only Find Them When They're Dead is a monster that thing launched. You know, I think it sold, in a couple of printings, it sold north of 90,000 copies. And then you get to Berserker, you know, and Berserker is... I don't even know how to put it into words. I mean, I never, uh, here, here's, here, here's, I'll, I'll give you this inside story. Okay, cool. We looked at that project and we figured we'd do 60,000 copies. And then retailers put initials in and it was looking to do 75. And we started to bop around and think maybe after the final orders were in, we'd be, we'd cross 100. And when I came up with the idea to put the one in 1000 on it, I thought I was my poor staff. I was like, we're going to hit 200. And they were all terrified because they thought the best <laughs> we could do would be like 125. And once we, you know, like we were waiting on those numbers. And then I had a very prominent retailer text me and say, I think you're going to hit 375. And I said, it's not going to happen. You're crazy. And that's bananas. Like, I'm hoping we hit 200. I can't even fathom that we would break two. If we break 200, I'm going to be the happiest lad in Christendom. And, you know, the, the book, you know, it, it, at six, it's now it's north of 625. Congratulations. And that is incredible. Thank you. And the thing, to put this in context, five years ago, Marvel relaunched Star Wars and they got about 500,000 orders in the comic shops. And then they got another 500,000 orders from Loot Crate. And so the Loot Crate orders, you know, Loot Crate, that's a whole different market. We're talking about what you sell through the comic book shops. So you have to go back past Star Wars and you go, you know, Batman, the new 52 relaunch. Mm -hmm. We've sold more than that. What's that? That's crazy. I mean, Batman, I don't know if you know this, the sales charts that you look at online, they are derived from Batman sales. Really? So, yeah. So ICB2 or Comicron, when you go on it, the thinking in it is that Batman is going to be in the top five best-selling comics forever. Mm -hmm. So let's use that as the index. Right? Cool. So that's that's how reliable Batman is to be huge. We outsold Batman. We outsold uh, Danger Girl was the best selling uh, original comic that wasn't Marvel and DC. I mean, I, I just, it's nuts. You have to go back to like Spawn and Wildcats and that's bananas. You know, so God bless you, Keanu. He's freaking terrific. I love the guy. He's, I'll tell you, he has, you know, given everything for the project. He is so totally committed. Now I've heard a lot of positive stories about him. I heard he's great to work with, super nice guy. Yes. Yes. How did that come about? Did he obviously I've read a lot of rumors in the past that he was interested in writing a book. He had these ideas for books. Now, did you approach him or did he approach you? So, you know, I want to write for books. That's in, that's insane. Yeah, what the way to sort of process that is we have a group of people that work 
in Hollywood um, every day. So we have a, a Hollywood team that handles the film and TV deals. So we have a TV deal with Netflix and we have a feature film deal with the company is called 20th Century. They're owned by Disney. It's the piece of 20th Century Fox that mm -hmm. is left over after Disney bought Fox. So Fox went this way and 20th Century went that way. So we have this group of people that all they do is talk to the town agencies. And they're uh, talking about the writers and directors. And we have a slate of 20 comic books, most of which have not been announced, that are in development as film and TV shows. So like right now, at this second, we are shooting a TV show in Atlanta. And it is called Just Beyond. And it's based on Arl Stein's series that he did, graphic novel series he did with us called Just Beyond. Awesome. I, that's right. I just said... It's called Just Beyond. It's based on Just Beyond. Yes, I'm a genius. So anyway, <laughs> um, it's being shot in Atlanta by uh, Seth Graham Smith is the showrunner, and it's going to be on Disney Plus uh, later this year. And so that is staffed with cast, and there's a crew, and there's directors, and there's writers. And so all those people are agented, and we're talking to the big talent agencies all the time. And we work with them hand in hand on all of our entertainment projects. And I don't know if you clocked this, we had a movie come out during quarantine. It was called The Empty Man. And it was released by 20th Century uh, on, the, on the film side. And it came out around uh, Halloween. And it was a lower budget uh, horror film. And so we have made movies, we're making TV shows, we're talking to these agencies all the time. And the folks over at William Morris uh, thought, well, you know, Keanu's very excited about doing a comic and we have a high opinion of Boom. And let's send Keanu over to talk to the Boom guys and maybe they'd be interested in doing uh, this comic. And so, you know, it's the most surreal thing to be in your office and walk out into reception and Keanu Reeves is waiting to see you. Um, you know, it, it's a hell of a thing to walk him into your office and sit down on your couch and he stood up uh, and he started to act it out. You know, he literally pulled his fist back and he said, you know, I, I, I can't do a can of voice that I'm, I, first of all, I'm terrible at being a mimic, but he was just like, I just want to punch through people. I just want to, I just want to punch through a guy's chest. I want to punch through a guy's head. I just want to rip through a dude, like tear his backbone out. And then I want to like hit another guy with the guy's backbone. Awesome. And if you've read the first issue, you <laughs> oh, know, absolutely. there it is. So and it was it was in that first pitch. And I'll tell you that first pitch, we spent three hours talking about the story. And at the end of it, he said, and we're going to hire Raphael Grandpa to do the cover. So and I think it was his way of telling us that he was a comic book reader. And he knew writers and artists and he had a uh, preference. And he's a huge Raphael Grandpa fan. And uh, we were like, yes, we will get Raphael Grandpa. He will do the cover for this. That is so cool. Yep. He knows his stuff. I love how it's like you're telling the story of it's so surreal. Like, oh, yeah, I walked out there. Keanu, he's he's there and I get to walk him in the office the whole time. I'd be thinking it's like, all right, I'm the boss. I get to do this right now. And then you, <laughs> right. And I then was you like, I was I was more like, ah, I'm scared. <laughs> that's all I'm saying. It's like you have to have this mindset. And then you sit down and he's like, I want to do this. I want to do this. Are you interested? Well, yeah, definitely interested. You know, we're not going to turn you down. Yeah, That's but I, I read through that whole issue. It was so cool. It's honestly exactly what I expected to be. I, I knew it was going to be probably lighter on the dialogue side. I knew it was going to be complete action packed. And I didn't really know where the story was exactly going until the very end. And they kind of, I'm not going to spoil anything. I'm assuming everyone here has probably read it, but either way, just kind of where the story's going, the direction of it. That's, that was so cool. And I'll tell you, all of that was in that first pitch. And one of the things that's really fun about pairing him with Matt Kent is, you know, Keanu wanted to go nuts. And I think part of it is because in John Wick, this is my opinion. This is nothing he said to me. Okay. But John Wick, everyone's in a suit. There's always, you know, the way that you talk, it's very polite. It's yes, sir. No, ma'am. Right. And you go into the Continental, the hotel, and the rules are very specific. And the action is so choreographed. It's not very bloody. 
and I know that I'm talking about John Wick, but what I mean is it's yeah. more like ballet than it is a meat grinder, right? Absolutely. I know exactly what you're talking about. So it's very pretty and it's very um, clean. And I think he had been in that world and he just wanted to like go nuts. It's, it's like he wanted to go berserk, you know, and it's like, let all of that out and get dirty and get grimy and get nasty mm -hmm. and just let that kind of um, testosterone uh, go out. And then he had this bigger mythological Jim Mint is here. Holy yeah. cow. What's going Damn. on, Jim? Hello, sir. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, can continue. I mean, that's what a warm suit. I know. Here I am, just regular LT. But um, I know I read through. I read through that, and I felt like every time I flipped the page, it's like wow. And I went back, relooked at it again, realized there's words on the page too. Then I had to reread it, and you know, then the artwork got caught up again. I'm huge into artwork. And not to get too completely off topic, because I definitely want to keep talking about this, but you talked about Once in Future before, how it's a monster. I think I read it's up to, it's going to be the 16th issue coming out, correct? That's right. Yep. I just, I read through all 15 issues. I think that's some of the best artwork that I've seen in a comic book in a very long time. It is gorgeous. Dan Moore My, is a beast. Oh, it's... Dan Moore is insane with that. My opinion, I know everyone's got a different opinion. I'm not huge into medieval, but I do really like the concept of that story, mm -hmm. how it's not completely focused on medieval, but it's that the stories are being told and then it happens and comes to life. The character dynamics and everyone, the character development's incredible in it too. So I just, you know, smart, we were talking smart, about artwork. Smart mouth granny, it. man. That's where it's oh, at. I know. It's, yeah. It's, I love it. It's sort of the idea is like, what if Obi-Wan Kenobi was your grandma and she smack talked to you all the time? And Grand's scary. I just love her. The I mean, I love Grand. So I just think she's so much fun and she's always running around with a gun and she's always, you know, taking shots. And so, uh, you know, my Texas might be showing, but I get a, I get a big <laughs> kick out of uh, badass granny. But the, um, the, to go back to Berserker, the thing that I think is really unique with Matt Kent is, you know, Keanu, he, it, it, it's overwhelming, right? So it's like, you're, you're working with a movie star and you have these moments when you're like, you know, you're talking back and forth and you're being professional and you're working on it, but there's a part of your brain that's like, oh my God, I'm talking to a movie <laughs> star, right? And it, and you can't look away, right? And you, I think the tendency would have been to kind of like rein him in and try to like be like, okay, well like, let's just not go completely crazy. Like let's pull this back. Let's organize it. Like, here's how you do a comic book. You need to do this and this and this. And the thing that Matt Kent did, Matt Kent was like, you know what? Let's pour fire on this. Like, let's like, Hey, Keanu, did you know that you can do more than that? Did you know that you can go crazier than that? Like, and, and from the jump, he was like, Kent was kind of a troublemaker. And he, he will love that I said that because he would like cock his head and look at me in these pitches because we brought Kent out to meet Keanu to make sure they got along and everything. And Kent would get this like pranksterish look on his face and he'd be like, well, we got to have extra pages for the first issue. You know, and he would like oh, yeah. put me put me on the spot. Like, are you going to say no to the movie star? And then he and then I remember we were working on the first idea was like first four issues of the first arc. And then Kent looked at me and was like, well, we got to have 12. You know, and so it was always just bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And I think that's what Keanu needed. Keanu needed this, the room and the stage to, to flex. And that's awesome. yeah, yeah. I think it's a really productive relationship. He was, he's the right. And, and, you know, like on the release day, I was, I was talking to Keanu and I said, I said that to him. I was like, I, I think that Kent was exactly the right guy for you because he gave you space to just go nuts and he knew how to put it into a comic book form. And, you know, Keanu is very interested in how comic books are made. You know, he spent a fair amount of time talking to Clem Robbins about lettering and how many characters are in his hmm. computer and how those characters are used. 
you know, one of the reasons, and now I'm not telling you a conversation I've had with him, but with Kino, I think one of the reasons he's had such a long career is he really understands process. You know, he takes the time. Like when we would work on story, I would reference something and he would come back the next week with, he has a notebook where he writes everything down and he'd flip it open and he'd be like, I went and I read that book. I read the whole book, right? I read the book. <laughs> I mean, I can't, you know, I can't read a recipe and he's read the whole book and it's like, and I think this, and I think that, and I see what you're talking about. And thematically, I agree. And, you know, it's very focused, you know, he's a guy that has lived with cinematographers and the stunt team and the, you know, every, you know, how are you going to block a scene and how, how do you do it? How do you creatively put it in a language? And he's really drilled down on, you know, when we were going through, Finding Ron Garney. It was like real specific style and action. When we contacted Ron and told him that Keanu liked his work, Ron thought that we were messing with him. Like Ron thought that's just what you tell people. We we're like, no, you don't understand. Like he, he likes you. He picked you. <laughs> like we'll put you on a Zoom with him and he'll tell you, you know? So he went through and looked at everybody and he had opinions, you know? That's so. awesome. And I don't know. I'm, I still think that would be insane. I, I've. It's cool that you have a firsthand experience and you're kind of confirming everything that I've heard about him as just a person. But it's really nice to hear like this firsthand experience that he really is just this genuine, he cares what he's doing. He puts his time into what he's doing. And the cool thing with this is it just seems like, I don't know, he had this idea. He showed up. He's obviously a movie star, a huge movie star. And you were still able to keep your focus as, you know, CEO, founder of Boom Studios. And he's bouncing these ideas off you. And it takes a lot for someone to right off the bat, just not completely accept what he's giving you. You clearly, you still said like, oh, it's a great idea. I like this. I like this. But you still had opinions. You still had your process that he has to follow. And I'm sure there's not a lot of people out there that would probably do that. They might say like, oh my God, he wants to write a book for me. Whatever you want to do, just go do it. You know, well, I think so, something something that creative people want is they want a real opinion, and I think creative people that are very successful, they're not looking for a yes response. They have done many drafts and they've gone through process where things improve, and they know that what they need to do is build a team. And part of it is if you're the person that says yes you don't pass the sniff test, right? You're too big of a pushover yes. um, and you're just there for the celebrity. And what Keanu was looking for was a creative partnership and he knew um, he needed to work with people that he could have a back and forth with and that he could um, forge. It. The nice thing about movies and TV that is similar to comics is it's a team mm -hmm. sport. You know, comic book publishing has a lot in common with making books. But books, an author sits down and writes it. And then an editor might read it and give some ideas. But, you know, we're talking about a team sport and making comics and that kind of collaboration. You know, you can't do it on your own. I mean, there's there are people like Jeff Smith who did Bone on their own. I don't mean to leave them out, but it's very rare. And so um, he was really looking. It, part of it was a test. It's like, if I kicked out a bad idea, would you tell me no? Or would you just go along with this because I'm Keanu Reeves? And if you are just going to go along with it, I'm not interested. And, you know, I, the, the best story about him that I could tell you is when he came in for the second meeting, he went into the reception area and there was an assistant there. And he said, hey, he remembered her name. She had talked to him about family member or a pet or something. And he remembered that person's or thing's name and asked about that. And I thought, that's awesome. I thought, I can't remember what my wife sent me to the grocery store for <laughs> 10 minutes ago. I mean, really, it's a problem, right? And here's this movie star who is two weeks ago came in here and had a casual conversation about, you know, is your dog okay? And, and now what? Now I realize I'm talking about John Wick and a dog, so everybody can crack jokes. Uh, but, I was you know, going to say, he clearly loves dogs. Yeah, he clearly that. loves dogs. Maybe more appropriate is like, is your cousin still sick or like whatever it was? 
And um, I just was really impressed. You know, it was very methodical, very kind, very, um, uh, you know, as I'm not sure movie stars can be characterized as down to earth, but I think if they can be, it would be him. That's awesome. So we were talking about the process a little bit, you know, obviously there's a team, you're working with a bunch of people, but what, can you elaborate and explain what the actual process of coming up with a comic book is? Like clearly there's ideas that are bouncing, but like the go, the, the whole, the process of it, of from an idea to on paper in the hands. Well, if you're going to talk, sort of the way Berserker's made is not necessarily the way most comics are made. We'll talk about Berserker, you know, uh, Keanu collaborates very closely with Matt Kent and Matt talks about, um, Keanu will call him on Saturday night and be like, okay, what are we, you know, let's work on the script. Uh, and so he, you know, they, they have a pretty big work at work ethic and uh, work very hard on all the materials. And so Kent will take the first pass and Keanu reads it very carefully and they go back and forth. Um, and then Ron Garney is a terrific veteran. You know, he knows what he's doing and he certainly knows how to lay out a comic book page. But mm -hmm. one of the funny notes that came back after Ron did, you know, turned in the first batch of pages was Keanu said, uh, bloodier, I want it more violent. I want it darker. I need more viscera. I need it gorier. Right. So Kenna will go through and, you know, we'll make notes, uh, specific notes on certain things. So, um, cool. and then, you know, it gets lettered and it gets colored and off you go. So, um, now other, you know, editorially, Eric Harburn's involved in all the steps of the process. Matt Gagnon, my editor in chief and, they read the different drafts and make suggestions and you know what you want is you want the creator to tell their story and so when we make suggestions to creators we make them as suggestions not commands and so we say this is your story but it might be cooler to end this beat at the bottom of the page so that when you turn the page the next beat has a big impact instead of put the beat in the middle of the page. And that's when, oh, I didn't think of that. That's a great way to go. Let's do that. So that's the kind of collaboration you want to have editorially. Now, creating most comics, it's usually, you know, James Tynan on something is coming with children. James knows how to write a, a, a comic book. So, you know, he indicates to Harburn what he wants to do. You know, he'll turn in the script. Harburn might make some suggestions. Maybe there's draft or two off. They go to Werther and, um, you know, then it gets colored, then it gets lettered. So cool. And yeah, I mean, obviously James tiny and he knows what he's doing. He's, he's killing it on Batman. No pun intended. He's doing very well. And something's killing the children. Something is and killing speaking, the Batman. Some, someone something's is killing, killing the Batman. Batman. Yeah. That's, that's going to be the new crossover series. I'm in. We got it going now. You heard it here first. No, but seriously, I the first time I heard something is killing children came out. I told everyone, like in my friends group, I thought, you know, this is going to be a huge series. I'm going to be honest. I didn't even get it when it first came. I wasn't able to get the first print right off the bat. And then I think the first copy I was able to get was I don't want to say the name wrong, but Jenny Friesen. Jenny Friesen. Friesen. I got that. Frizen, I got that yep. cover and I read it immediately and I was like, wow, this is incredible. I think I initially saw that it was slated to be five issues, I believe, maybe six issues. And I thought, yeah, that makes sense. I'm not exactly sure where they can go with this. And a few issues deep, I was like, man, they better not end this in a couple issues. I need more of this. And then they kept going. And I thought, all right, so this arc's done, but how can they truly keep this series going? And you know, now, now the world is open. How yeah. Slaughter came, they did their thing, they saved the town. Erica, she's off doing her own thing. And I thought to myself reading it, I mean, obviously I don't know what's going to happen in the story, but I thought now you can go so many different directions. What if you focus the story on just how Slaughter, maybe there's a new Erica or a new character in how Slaughter you want to focus maybe a new arc on or side stories with just her. And it's just a whole world now of something is killing the children that you guys created. And it started off with me thinking you might, I don't know how they can expand after five or six issues of this. And now you have a whole world of it. It's incredible what you guys have done with this series. Well, thank you. So now here's where I'm going to plug my YouTube show. So uh, most people might not know. I have a, a little channel where I interview creators uh, talking about process. And on that show, 
James Tynan talks about the original five issue vision for something is killing the children is basically the first 15 issues was supposed to be the first issue. So the idea was she comes to town in one and done 22 pages. She comes, fights the monster, saves James, off she goes. She gets on a bus, goes to the next town. And so you can see how expansively, like he was thinking it was sort of five one and done sort of like vignettes that were lined okay. up. And and so you can see how it start, as he started to write the first issue, he uh, you know called us and was like, hey, I think this is bigger than that. And we were like, all right, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's <laughs> Let's make it bigger. So um, he's not, you know, James is not shy. And so a lot of times, one of the uh, one of the jokes in the interview is he he's always asking DC Comics and Boom for more rope. He's like, how much rope do I have? And that always ends up on my desk. So people are like, how many issues can James have? And the answer on something that's killing the children is as many as he wants. Yeah, let him keep going. Yep. So, so that's one of the things that I really love about independent companies, specifically, obviously you and image. Those are my two go-to, but the one problem I've been having with Marvel is someone commented in one of my last videos. They said, Marvel feels very corporate. It's you have this idea for a comic book. You have this character. They have to follow these rules and the book has to follow some sort of guideline. And I think that's what I love about independent comics so much is that you're here and you say, James tiny and it's like, Oh, you want more issues of something that's killing children. You want to expand it. You think you're going to do more than five issues. You want to rewrite the story, do whatever you want because clearly you have this idea. I don't think Marvel would do that. I think Marvel would say, well, you know, we're just going to do this anyway. You know, we're going to have to appease, you know, the higher ups. And I just, I don't know. That's why I love going to your company and specifically image as well. Well, you know, Marvel is such a incredible company. They are uh, legendary. They have accomplished so much. It it it's the thing about Marvel that you have to wrap your head around is they are the new upstart in comparison to DC. DC is the legendary, you know, nineteen thirty eight first time they ever published, and it was another uh, twenty five years before Marvel did something that had any level of competition with DC. Uh, they're so legendary. And now it's 60 years later. And what are they going to do? Kill Spider-Man? They better not. You see my room. You see all the spider <laughs> see, They better but, not. But, but, but you could accuse that of being corporate, right? Because at the end of the day, they can't just do whatever they want. And there's a way in which it's bigger right? It's like the fans own Spider-Man, right? It's and like I agree with that too. the world, the universe owns Spider-Man and they're the caretakers and their job is to deliver for that. Whereas, you know, James and Werther and boom, you know, it's like, you can go kill Erica Slaughter. You can kill her. You can kill her. And, you know, one of the things that's interesting in genre fiction, and so now I'm going to get into a conversation with your dad. This is uh, the more expansive viewpoint when you've really kind of studied the field, the first adventure character that had long lifespan, that had a beginning, a middle, and an end was Conan. And now it, Conan didn't originate in comics, Conan originated in short stories, but it was the move from Conan the Barbarian to Conan the King. And Conan gets old and he has an end to adventuring. And in that framework, you see sort of the publishing sort of problem, which is you know, go back and look at the original Spider-Man stories. He's in, he's in high school and then he goes to college and then he stays in college for like 30 years. Right. Hey, hey you know, so it takes a while for some people. Right. Right. <laughs> so it's like, you, you know, as you hit upon these formulas like Peter Parker being in school that work, you want to keep them going and it's what the audience wants, but then you have a college yeah. student for 30 years, right? So it's a, it's challenging to do what they do to do. You know, the world wants more Batman comics than you can publish and wants more Spider-Man comics than you can publish. It wants more Hulk comics that you can publish. And Oh, by the way, they can't be the same comic book every single time. They have to be different. If they're too different, yeah. then they need to be more like they're the same. 
right? If you make the stories too different, the fans buy them and say, this is too different. So you're sort of damned if you do, damned if you don't. And it's, you know, running one of those companies is hard. I, you know, I know Dan Buckley used to be the publisher and now he's the forgotten his term. He's Joe Q's chief creative officer, but Dan has a high muckety muck title like that. But he and I were drinking at San Diego Comic-Con one year and, and Dan said to me, you know, I can't do what you do, Ross. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you get out of bed in the morning, you could do anything you want. He said, when I publish, I have, it's all laid out for me. It's like Captain America needs a refresh. So we're going to refresh Captain America this year. Next year, we'll do the Hulk. The year after that, we'll do Iron Man. The year after that, we'll do the X-Men, right? And I said, Dan, you know, if I was chained up to specific characters like that, I'd jump out the window. I love getting up in the morning and who knows where the day is going to take you. Like it could, it could be the next big franchise or it could be a complete dead end. So I love the unpredictability. I love the freedom. I like exploring things. I like the cutting edge. You know, I don't want to be hemmed in by 80 years of continuity. That is honestly an incredible answer. I mean, I, I totally agree with all that. I get it. It is one of those things, you know, it's Marvel say, like you're saying, Spider-Man, I'm, Everyone that's watching this right now knows I'm not a big fan of Nick Spencer's current Spider-Man run. It's just not what I believe to be Spider-Man, but you know, there are people that probably do like it. And these writers, they are what you said, chained down to writing a character a certain way. And if they do go off the rail a little bit, they might get a lot of backlash. So it, you're right. It is one of those tough things, but that's, you well, know, Nick's that's a great writer. Them. You know, Nick's, you know, his deadliest, I think it's deadliest foes of Spider-Man is one of the most loved Spider-Man stories of the past like decade. And so you're always in the situation where you can't please everybody all the time. So, you know, I agree, but you know, this is where I figure out how to bring up the fact that we're doing magic, the gathering. How's that? I was going to bring that up. (laughs) I I know people growing up. I grew up, I never played magic, but I grew up with magic, the gathering people went from Pokemon cards to magic oh, yeah. and everyone's trying to get me to hop on it. Like, Hey, you know, magic's the cool new thing. And I was like, Oh my God, I buy Yu-Gi-Oh! I buy Pokemon. I can't buy this. And someone told me, they said, you know, they're coming out with a magic, the gathering comic. And I was thinking, how the hell can they make a comic of this? There are, it's kind of like dungeons and dragons from, I believe it's dark horse. That you can just go any direction with that. IDW does the dungeons. Or is it, it's yeah. it's IDW. Yeah. So what? What? Who proposed that idea for Magic: The Gathering? I mean, it's still incredibly popular. Being in the military, there are so many people that play Magic: The Gathering. It's unreal. And yeah, well, Hasbro pitched us. Really? So that's awesome. You know, we're very lucky um, because you know we do the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers comics. And uh, that's owned by Hasbro. And it used to be Saban, and then Hasbro bought Saban's uh, ownership in those franchises. And um, Hasbro liked what we did with the Power Rangers, and they pitched us, and the brand team that runs Magic the Gathering pitched us on uh, doing stories based on that. And there's a well-developed history. There's a bunch of uh, high-profile characters and, you know, it's so well built out that there was a D&D expansion that came out a few years ago that is based on Magic the Gathering. So the city of Ravnica um, has an entire source book in Dungeons and Dragons. And so uh, that, for us, it was a real challenge. We thought of it as, you know, with Power Rangers, Marvel published Power Rangers, Image published Power Rangers, there was a bunch of companies. I think there was a company called Hamilton that published Power Rangers and nobody had ever really commercially cracked it. And uh, magic is the same way where the issues that had cards in them sold really well. And then the ones that didn't have cards did not sell nearly as well. And we thought, well, you know, if you, there are all these people that love magic, the gathering, and there's this really well articulated mythology. And Mm -hmm. one of the things that gets us excited about comic book publishing is bringing new people to read comics. And Berserker does that. There, we've had story after story after story of retailers telling us that people who've never read a comic book before are going into comic shops and are buying it because of Keanu. 
And mm-hmm. in that same way, we thought, you know, there's all these people that go to magic tournaments in comic shops and they walk right by the comics. And what if we did a magic comic that they were really excited to read? Because for whatever reason, they're not reading the magic comics that have been published in the past 20, 25 years. And I haven't read those books, so I don't know one way or the other. But the challenge is, is what if you could do something that they would pick up? And the initial sales for the book is eight times better than the book was previously. And I was sitting down today actually trying to do the math, and I think it's the best-selling magic comic book in 25 years. And so it's really exciting that we got everybody's attention. We put out that ash can uh, Mm -hmm. that's basically a look at the first issue. And we did that so retailers would be able to understand and see. And we're hoping that they passed it around the shop and showed it to their magic players and that they had that as a tool to be able to place those orders so that they understood the comic book that they could, that they were going to order and get and get excited about it so that they could push it to their fans and they have come through. So we have high expectations for that first issue. It's very exciting. And hopefully we can convert some of these magic fans into comic book readers and get everybody jazzed for it. And I would go so far as to say, to go back to getting new people to read comics. I think something is killing the children is the kind of that first trade is the sort of graphic novel that you could read. You could give to somebody that's never read a comic book before and they could get into it and read it. And you don't need to know a bunch of continuity and you don't need to know a bunch of specific things that are specifically about comics. You know, like Watchmen is a little tough if you've never read a comic book before. Right. So yeah, it's kind of the deep end of the pool, but I feel like you can give somebody something is killing the children and they can follow along and understand the story and get into it. And so, you know, I think it lumberjanes is like that for us. You know, there are so many people that have gotten into reading comics because of lumberjanes. And, you know, I think that's one of the unifying things that we're interested in is getting people to read comics that have never read comics before. You guys are doing a great job on it too. Honestly. Thank you. Thank you. And I've seen, or I guess, um, going to shops recently, obviously I'm up to date on all the books that are coming out from all the different publishers. It seems though, obviously you guys have your ongoings, but there's a, also a lot of mini series. So do you start off as a mini series, like these five issues, just for example, I know origins is, I think a six issue or a five issue. I think Proctor Valley road, one of the newest ones is slated for five or six issues. Mm-hmm. Now do you initially start off as that for like, you know, this is kind of going to be the first arc. And if it's popular, if it's selling well, fans want it, are we going to expand? Or do you just kind of say, these are the five issues, this is the full story, and move on? I think a lot of that stuff is from the creator. And so, you know, when we're talking about Something is Killing the Children, one of the series that we haven't talked about is what James did with us before, which was The Woods. So almost 10 years ago, James had a book published from us called The Woods, and it lasted 36 issues, and it was massively successful. It was a huge indie hit. And so um, we knew that James had written long form before, and so we were trying to kind of coax out of him a longer, longer series, but he needed to creatively see it. You know, Origins Mm -hmm. was always pitched, and as well as Proctor Valley Road, was always pitched as self-contained. And so what we really want to do is we want to listen to the creator. And a lot of times we have a conversation, they see it as a mini series. Maybe we go, well, why aren't you doing it as an ongoing? And, um, you know, I, like I certainly am uh, interested in maybe extending the berserker uh, length, uh, which was something that I was in that conversation from the beginning. So that's a easy thing. Uh, to talk about, but it's like, you know, we don't want to make a creator be forced to tell more story just because the book's selling well. And yet at the same time, if people are excited about it and they want more story, we want to be able to have a conversation with them about maybe there's room here to tell more story. That's all. That's good. That's cool that you're not, I mean, obviously you're not going to be forcing them to write more, but it's cool that you kind of leave it up to them and say, you know what, this is your idea. This is your plan. If you see it as a mini series and you can get the full story across, let's get it done. But if you want to expand it, you think you can keep going with it. That's cool too. That's really cool to see, you know, you as who you are, you know, the CEO of boom studios being able to make those calls, just letting them free reign. 
Well, part of what we philosophically do at Boom that I think is something that makes us a little different is we think of it as a partnership with the creator. And so, you know, an example of that is when you do a book at Image, Image's philosophy is completely different. Image's philosophy is it is the creator. Basically, the creator is publishing themselves at Image and the creator's doing their thing. They're just telling their story and whatever they want to do. And there's no editors, you know, like it is all up to them. And our philosophy is different. Our philosophy is we want to partner with a comic book creator. And so when, what does partnership mean? It means editorially, we're going to have conversations about the art. We're going to have conversations about the story. We are going to go back and forth and have discussions. We're not here to tell you how to tell your story. We're here to tell the story better. And a lot of creators come to us. Uh, you know, Kieran Gillen, who created Once in Future, uh, had a huge hit at Image called Wicked and the Divine. And he came to Boom because he wanted an editorial voice. And he wanted to work with an editor and not with Wicked and Divine. He, he, he and, uh, um, for the love of Mike, I've forgotten his co-creator's name. Please forgive me. But they just decided whatever they wanted to do, they went and did it. But what Kieran wanted was he wanted a third voice in the mix to talk about it and um, bounce things off of. And we have a marketing team. We have a Simon & Schuster book deal. Uh, we have a Hollywood presence. And so we come and go, hey, we want to be your partner and we want to make this hugely successful and we want to collaborate hand in hand with you. And this is not all on you. And now some people want it all on them. Like Ed Dukeshire, uh, I said Ed Dukeshire, um, the, uh, um, uh, 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 good Lord, uh, Ed Brubaker, sorry. Hey, Ed Dukeshire. Um, Ed Brubaker wants to make all the, the calls on criminal and Ed, Ed is a genius and he does a brilliant work, but it's not, you know, people like Kieran, sometimes they want image, sometimes they want boom. It's a different approach. It's a different thing. So that, that's really cool. I'm, I've heard that image is kind of like that, where you have this idea, you make it happen, but I never knew kind of the more in-depth process of it. So they look at it as, you know, you have this idea for a book, you make the book, you get whoever you want to do with it. And now we'll put it out. But that's really cool on your side of it, where you have, you know, partnership. I like that. Yeah. Image was founded by comic book creators. And so their attitude is, I'm not going to tell another creator what to do. Right. And so, and which I, I'm friends with the partners. I think they're geniuses. They're comic book legends. It's just a different flavor of ice cream, right? It's a different approach. It's a different, um, you know, it, it's not that images approach is right. And boom's approach is wrong or vice versa at, at the core of it. It's like, as a creator, how do you want to go through the process? You know, I think we're great at support. <laughs> I think we do support really well. We support creators really well. That's the aim. Cool. What I like about that too is, is I mean, obviously, you know, everyone always fights what's better, Marvel or DC, you know, who likes which character more, but you never really hear that about boom and image. It's like, Oh, well, I like booms books better. I like images books better. It's more of, you've got these two great companies and they both produce great books. And Thank I like you. that. It's, it's never heated. It's never heated arguments. Like, Oh, have you read this from boom? Or it's never like, oh, I don't, I don't read Boom because you know I'm a, I'm an image guy. But you know, people that are Marvel and DC, they talk like that to each other. Well, and and to me, what I think we need is we need great comics. Like, Absolutely. Can you have too many great comics? Like I want everything Boom puts out to be great. I want everything that Image puts out to be great. I want everything that IDW and Dark Horse and DC and Marvel puts out to be great. And I'll tell you, I go to the shop every Wednesday. And what I want is a giant stack of comics. That's what I want. I want to be standing there at the rack and being like, oh, I got to get this. Uh, my wallet is stretched thin, but I absolutely positively, I got to get this. And I um, know uh, that's a problem to me. Yeah, yeah. And, and But you know what the shop is like when that happens is you go on Wednesday and it's rocking, right? People are just yep. bouncing around and they're psyched and they're picking out their different variant covers and they're, bopping and they can't wait to get home or sometimes guys get in the parking lot before the, you know, then they, they got to crack the comic open and read it in the parking lot. So you know, we that. need that energy. Yeah. 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 I, I, I hear I, you. 
I get in the I get in the Jeep and I sit down. I open the bag and I'm like, oh yeah, let's go. I got this one, got this one. And even last week was considered a light week. And I walked out and I still managed to spend, I think it was like $53. And I was like, I was like, what did I buy? I said this was a light week. Absolutely, me too. But, but that's what I love about this channel and the stuff that I do because I always try to promote you need to read these books. Everyone, there's so many people that are putting out speculation. We need to buy this for this reason. And then two weeks down the line, after you spent four times, five times the amount that the book's worth, it's back down to a dollar bin book. And it's like, damn, like I really bought that. It's like you need to read these books and appreciate it. You got to look at the artwork, the story, the character development. There's so much more than just flipping it for a couple bucks. No, I completely agree. And at the core of it, I'm not here. If people want to sell their comics, I'm not here to condemn them and tell them that they're doing it wrong. Uh, at the same time, it, it is a storytelling medium. And the thing that I would really encourage people to remember is, you know, Watchmen is considered one of the greatest stories that's been told in the medium. And the reason that a Watchmen number one is a collectible back issue is it's a great story. And Kingdom Come is like that. You know, like, there's all these famous storylines. You know, the reason people care about Spider-Man was you go back and you read Silver Age Marvel and the first 40 issues of Spider-Man 50, they're just spectacular. Uh, I'm, that's a pun. They're, they're just hands down brilliant. You know, they're just staggering yeah. how great they are. And, and they're 60 years old. They, I mean, you can't read it. I can't watch a movie that's 60 years old anymore and, and get the same charge out of it. So, you know, it's great comics. That's the thing. It's like, it really it's is. all about the experience. And I know we've been talking about some of his killing children a lot, but even a lot of people have been hitting me up. Cause I mean, I'm not going to lie. I do sell my books occasionally mm -hmm. here and there. I have a lot of hard covers. I buy trade paperbacks and sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, books are selling for a lot of money. If I can get the same exact thing in a trade paperback, why not? But mm -hmm. as far as that series goes, I mean, obviously it's I, like I said, I don't know if you've seen it on eBay, but the full run with, you know, first print cover A's, all that is selling for upwards closer to a thousand dollars for the full run. And people have been asking me, are you going to, are you going to flip it? And logically, why would I not? I can get it in a trade paperback, but I can't bring myself to do it. I love that series so much. I recommend it to everybody. I say, you need to check it Thank out. You the artwork, the story, the cool thing that I love about boom studios. And this is such a small thing. is just your, your, the covers you use. It feels like a nice book in your hand. Thank you. It's, it's not some cheap paper. It feels like I actually have a product that I need to care about that I'm holding. I really appreciate it. Like we've got a great production department and yeah, um, it's incredible. You know, Kate Henning does an excellent job with that stuff. It's, it's something I'm, you know, she, she's, she's a genius. Like there's, there's so many books out there and this isn't to be, this isn't to put down Marvel because obviously I really like Marvel too, but a lot of those books, it feels so cheap in your hand. And I know they're, they have a lot of stuff they need to put out. They have a lot of covers. They have a lot of different series and I, I get it, but I get so many books from the comic shops that are just, they're wavy. And I mean, and that's just, you know, packaging all the books that are coming and sometimes they're damaged, but just. I don't know. Boom studio. It just, it feels really good in your hand when you're reading it. It just feels like a book Thank that you. you can appreciate. Thank you. Appreciate it. But a lot of people keep asking, is there going to be a Q and a tonight? So that's going to be up to you. If you want to answer a bunch of questions, we can set um, a time. Let's, let's and, do like, yeah. uh, I could do like 10 more minutes and then if that's fine with you. All right. All right. That's fine. So 10 minutes of just Q and a or, yep. All right, we can do that. So everyone that's in the comments section right now, everyone that's viewing, whatever questions you got, ask away, and I'll put it up on the screen. And we got one first one. We got it from Joe Doyle. Oh, and everyone that's in here right now, Doyle on Instagram does incredible artwork. Check him out. He's always got good stuff. Um, he's also, correct me if I'm wrong, but he can send books in the CGC to get a signature series. I'm not 100% sure on that, but I'm almost positive. All right, so. so the question is, Is when do you know it's time to end the run? Um, we really listen to the creators when it comes to that. And uh, the other thing is, is we'll look at the sales projections. And so 
we'll be doing sales projections. And if a series is running out of steam, we'll be talking to the creator and we're saying like, hey, how can we wrap this up in a way that's satisfying to the fans and go back and forth? Maybe we can't do three arcs. Maybe we do two. And uh, let's make sure that we complete the story so people don't feel uh, like they're left with a bad reading experience. So it's a bit of a back and forth. You kind of figure it out as you go along. Cool. Um, so hold on. So I'm going to kind of talk about both these ones together because it says, will there be a hardcover for Sunday's Killing Children? And I also want to combo that with, will Richie announce the Sunday's Killing Children series for TV? I'm just going to answer that for him. I'm in his DMs all the time asking him that question. <laughs> and I, I already know he's going to say there's nothing there. I, but there is there. I, you know it. <laughs> I just love that you think you could send me a direct message on Instagram and I'm going to tell you. I just think that's hilarious. And I just love, like, I'll sit there and I'll be like, hmm, what is the you most know I have frustrating way that I can answer this question? How can I, how can I pull his leg? How can I have him on? So um, I so, expect, I expect a no every single time. I don't expect any answers, but I always have to ask every time you post a book or you post like something related. Right, right, but but just, here's the thing. Have I said that there's not going to be? And that's why I keep DMing you saying, when's it coming out? Right. I haven't said there's not going to be, and I haven't said there is going to be. So um, I just say, I usually say I would be really excited to watch that. That's usually my response. So, um, the is there going to be a hardcover? Um, I would stay tuned. All right, I like that one too. I was I was waiting for that answer. <laughs> All right, I, this is actually to be this clear. Really I one. didn't say yes. I just said I would stay tuned. I'm staying tuned for it. All right, this is a pretty good one. How do we submit a story to be made into a comic book? So, um, here is a piece of career advice. Google is your friend. So put your questions into Google. If you put that question into Google, you will see if you write submissions, Boom Studios, that will take you to the part of our website that handles submissions. And I guarantee you that every single major publisher has a, sub, a submissions area on their website that will answer your question. So. Cool. I'm going to be honest. I was kind of wondering that same question. I'm, I'm assuming you don't just get an email one day. It says, Hey, I got this idea, but do you actually go through all of these or do you have a team that's like, Hey, we read say 20 different submissions. Five of them are actually really good. Are you the one to narrow that down? Or do you have another team that would go from there? Well, the thing is, is, you know, the first barrier that exists is if we open our submissions to anyone, that exposes us to litigation. So let's say you have an idea that's similar to one that we have been working on. And our comic comes out and we pass on you. And then you say, you stole my idea. Right. So we rely upon most often what it is, is it's you have a published profile in the comic book business and mm -hmm. you have a history of professional or professionalism uh, where you've been working and, you know, this is your career and, um, you know, sort of demonstrated reasonable behavior. And so the other thing that I would counsel I, I've done some videos on Instagram and some videos on YouTube on the channel about this is we reduced our output in 2019 by 15% because we believed that if we did less titles that there would be, they would all sell better. And that was the year that we launched something is killing the children once in future. So that proved to be true. And then in 2020, we cut our line back 10% more. And that year we had record sales with, we only find them when they're dead and seven secrets and, and wind. And so what's happening is our pipeline is constricting 
right? So we're going to 15% one year and 10% the next, which is a lot for publishing. And what happens is, is you're submitting your work in competition with Kieran Gillen and James Tynan and Al Ewing and Tom Taylor and, you know, Jed McKay just came on Magic the Gathering. And if you don't know Jed's work, you need to get to know it. He's writing Black Cat at Marvel and it's excellent. You know, Jed's really is a good series. It's Jed's, Jed's a monster. I've been after editorial to get Jed for a long time. And so you're in a place where, you know, you're competing with people that have been in the business for 10, 15, 20 years that are, um, you know, very talented. And so it's a very difficult place to put yourself. And so competition's tough and the slots are dwindling, right? And so that's a hard place to start your business. You know, in my opinion, if I wa if I wanted to do comics today, I would go find an artist. There's a lot of resources to do it. I know there's places on Reddit. You, I would go find an artist online. I would create a short story, something that was very doable, like 20 page short story. Okay. I would set a really low bar on Kickstarter. Grand, two grand. I don't know what the number is. The point isn't you and your artist are going to do all the work on spec. The point is just to try to cover the postage and the printing costs. Okay. But once you do that and you go and you kickstart it, then you have a piece of work. You're a comic book writer, right? So you have a writing sample that you can submit to Scout Comics or you can send it to SourcePoint Press or Mad Cave Studios or Oni Press or like there's a million great publishers. And that's how these publishers discover talent is Scout sources kickstarted projects all the time. I, it's my understanding, maybe I'm wrong, but that I believe that's where they get a lot of talent. And so cool. now you've written a comic, now go do it again. And then instead of it being one shot, do it, do two issues and then do three issues and then do four issues. Well, now you're building a library of content that you own, right? And you have a mailing list and you have a fan base. You have a group of people. Now they probably start out as your friends and family, but you can grow it from there because there's a group of people on Kickstarter that look for comic books to back and you can build your email list. And then someday conventions are going to come back and you can go set up at a table and you can build your email list and relationships. And now you're off and running. But you know, the truth of the matter is, is it's a lot of work. It takes a long time. I just did this interview with Matt Kent that's on my YouTube channel. And I know I'm obnoxious because I keep talking about it. But the thing is, is you go look at Kent. He worked for 10 years before he got published, published. Damn. Like he used to make mini comics, okay? And he used to take them to the comic shop, drop them off, and never come back to collect the money. And you ask him, why didn't he come back to collect the money? He was afraid they didn't sell, and he didn't want to know if they didn't sell. He was doing it just to get better at, it, at his craft. So it's a lot of work. you got to really focus. If you go look at these interviews that I'm doing, every, I work really hard to get the creator to talk about the process of breaking in. How long did it take? What were the steps? What did you think your strengths were? How long did it take you to do these different things? And I think there's a wealth of information that's there that you can go find out. But if I were you, I would go kickstart a short story, 20 pages long, do that, fulfill it, do it again, do it again, do it again, and build a body of work. You can get paid to do it through crowdsource. So that's my two cents. Incredible answer. And on Thank that you. note, we could end it on that one. So I yeah. just want to say before we end it, uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking thank the time. Thank you for having me. Day. Oh, absolutely. It's my pleasure. You, you're, you're a busy man. And you took you're time out of your day. And so at this last time, if there's any shout outs you want to do, I know you mentioned Kickstarter. I know you have that Power Ranger Kickstarter going on right now for that massive set that I'm well, still eyeing up. Well, that, yeah, that wrapped up, but that did really well, which we're thankful. We Is it done? Yeah, we did over 800 grand on that one. So that, Damn. that, that was the Power Rangers community was terrific with, with that one. So we're, we're really thankful for that. Um, I would just say, keep your eyes peeled for magic. It's coming in April and um, Berserker number two uh, pre-orders are due Monday. So if you want to keep reading your Keanu comic, tell your retailer 
If you want a particular variant, uh, try to let them know because they're going to have to place their orders on Monday and it's uh, last call for placing their uh, final orders for that book on Monday. Awesome. Well, it's all good stuff. As I said, thank you again. Thank you, everyone that tuned in. We went an hour and 15 minutes. It's incredible. So thank you again, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you. Have a great weekend. See ya.